much as possible. Don't over grip it. You know, a lot of times we over grab the handle and it's very hard to maneuver. So just relax. It's an extension of your body. Actually, if, uh, if uh, you don't have an apparatus or if you want to practice it, actually we did, it's, it's practicing the sword without the sword. So what ha happens is because the sword is an extension of the body and it's just highlighted when you have it in your hand, but it's much easier to learn when you have the apparatus in here because it's much more tangible. But once you've kind of developed the muscle memory and you know the integration of those movements, that side of the visualization and also the experience of you know what it feels like without the apparatus is something that um, is really a heightened awareness and sensitivity of of the movements. So you know whether you're doing a staff or a spear or any of these apparatus, it just gives you. Um, you know, sort of the virtual interpretation of the movement, but can you align the body and feel the same uh, expression when you're doing it? Uh, it's sort of like whatever you've learned over time, you've actually developed a, a pattern for those type of things, whether it's uh, writing or maybe um, culinary type things or using a tool. So if you sort of demonstrate the motion, you can almost pick up what you're doing with it. You know, in other words, if you're chopping, you're like this. If you're writing, say you're writing your name, you can kind of script it in space. Or if you're um, maybe sawing a piece of wood and you have this action like this, or you're drilling something like this, you can see that you're mimicking that. Or lifting your hand as if you're lifting a cup, you simulate that motion. So if you take the sword and you slice and you chop, you can create those motions. But don't forget that all of these directional motions have been already somewhat learned during the empty hand form, like diagonal flying, like neutral position, hoop position, stabbing like this or punching like this. You've, you've kind of simulated these motions already you know, a back fist, a chop, a diverting. You've learned this from grass to sparrow's tail. So if you had your sword in the hand, you would follow that motion. So if we were to say, begin the form, I'm gonna do it like this just to see what it's like. You're gonna hold the sword and you're like this. And you go up and you turn and you grasp the sparrow's tail as if you have this apparatus in your hand, and you go like this, right? You grab the sword, and you go one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. So you can see, can you capture the motion as you go over, as you shift and you turn, and you sit back and you push forward, and you slice, and you go over the head, and you come down and you poke, and you heel kick, and you push and you turn. It's a little bit trickier to do without the apparatus because you don't have the same tangible motion that you're doing. But the thing is, once the body knows the sequence, then that's exactly what you're doing, is following the motion and you're creating the action as if it's in your hand. So you can see you're creating the same motion 
without the sword. So that's really sort of a sample of what your body will learn. Now, you know, everything that we do, it's learned. Motor skill is learned, motor skill is developed, motor skill is um, developing these patterns and, you know, sort of recognition as to what these movements are. So when you look at a posture, you look at an image. So we store these images, we store all this information up in here, and it's up to the brain to kind of decipher it, interpret it, and interpret it based on the information you give it. Now, you could give it false information based on a misunderstanding. So then you would go back and then you would have to fix that or then reinterpret it or um, recalibrate it to understand it in a different way. So this is how we learn. <clears throat> this is a process and, you know, as our sort of knowledge expands and you begin to sort of evolve through these you know, paces, then eventually um, you'll be able to figure out a lot of this. So, um, so we're going to go through the form now from here. I think this is one of the ways we've been following. Well, you have the mirror. We open the stance. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Turn. One, two, three, four. One, two. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two. So what ends up happening is the movements become fuller because now you can turn your waist and you can feel the movements because you have something in your hand. And the lines of movement are much clearer because you're creating this action in a direction. And we push. We sit back. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. And sink. One, two, Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three. Four, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, one. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, and then back to horse stands. Then we step up again and then repeat the diagonal fly and then we're here. One, two, three, four. One, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, and close. So that's the whole sequence. Reviewing that again. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Okay, so I think um, sequentially, you know, it's fairly long, takes about four to five minutes to do, depending on the speed of the movement, but there's no rush, take your time, try to get the fullness and the motion. Uh, the waist cut is horizontal, so your wrist has to be slightly Flex like that. Just let your wrists, let your joints kind of relax to find the structure to support this. And then eventually you'll use a lot less strength because strength will actually be a conflict if you're using the wrong strength. And that's something that we try to develop as an understanding. So movements are created, but then, you know, which... Uh, joints should you be manipulating and which uh, uh, muscles are you actually using to create that action. So a lot of movements that we do that go over the head or um, twist the legs, it is a lot of uh, things that we're doing that normally our musculature is not actually doing. Uh, a lot of the turning over, the pivotal stuff, you know, the shoulders, you know, a lot of these actions are not um, produced when we're doing just everyday type things. Uh, we might, you know, actually do them in the wrong way when we're not used to it, and then we end up er injuring our shoulder. You know, you're not a professional painter or you're not a professional uh, arborist and you're trying to go uh, chop a tree down on a weekend because, you know, it was in your yard and then you end up not really knowing how to do it because of the body mechanics and you end up hurting yourself because uh, you're not in the right position to lift the branch or you're not in the right position to cut it. You know, these are, these are um, skills actually. So someone that does this all the time is always going to be in the right position and they've got all the uh, understanding of how to be safe. Um, just like painting and going up on a ladder, you're not used to go up on a ladder, you're usually not very good at it. And you know, one of the things that happens, even if you're standing on a ladder, 
because you're not used to it, you're using a little bit more tension in your legs than you normally would be doing uh, in a situation. So you go up there and then after you know, maybe half an hour or an hour of that kind of work, the next day your, your legs feel like you, you know, they're, they're very tired because you're using some excessiveness in doing that type of a, a, a task. And when you go up a ladder, the higher you go, the more tense you are because there's a fear of falling. So, you know, these are all responses that your body um, takes on simply because of the not knowing. You know, what, not knowing is a, is a big deal because a lot of things that we do, we don't really know when we try to fumble through it. And on a physical level, if you don't know, there's a good chance that you're going to hurt yourself. So, so you have to be careful. Uh, one good thing and advantage that we that you gain from doing Tai Chi is you can learn and you're actually not rushing you take your time and the chance of injury when you're doing something slow is much um, less likely you know it's sort of like driving your car the chance of uh, a serious accident happens when you're at higher speeds very you know slow speeds you know there's very minor damage if something happens so that just kind of gives you some of the uh, you know, ideas of how you have to think. Okay, so let's go through this again. And you're in the shoulder width stance, and we'll do it nice and slow. We step up and create the half circle, and we press. We sit and turn. We shift and create movements similar to grasp the sparrow's tail. You're holding the sword in one hand, and we turn, and this is like brush knee. Create the upper or shoulder hoop. Here's your vertical elbow. And now the sort of like Jade Lady work shuttle. One, two, three. Just split that right in half. Neutral. And create the circle. One, two, drag it up. Three, four, turn. Five, six, seven. Eight, nine, and poke. One, two, three. One, you can kick up if you want, because that's an unweighted leg. One, Two, sit back, get your spine over the supporting leg, and lift the knee, heel kick, plant the foot, shift your weight, step through, and push. Sit back, one, two. Now here, repeat, one, two, Three, turn, horse stance to T, back to neutral, and push. Sit back, horizontal sword, turn, step up, poke down, repeat, one, two, sit back, turn, Cut up, down, poke, one, push again, sit back, shift your weight, half step forward, and poke. Set it up on your arm, lift, and turn, one, two, 
three, one, two, three, and we're going to turn this way. Slide. One, two, three. So we set up every position before we execute. Vertical, one, two, three, one, two, switch the feet, three, one, two, three, four, turn, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, we have a phone call, it was probably telemarketing, chop, roll back and divert, shift, and chop, poke, and neutral, one, two, three, one, two, three, turn, one, two, three, one, two, three, right, one, two, three, four, 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 one, two, right? So two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. Okay. So you see what I mean by setting up each movement? You can't avoid the vertical, horizontal, slant as directions. And you have to prepare the movement because this is three-dimensional. It's not, you know, like on a screen where you only see two dimensions, very flat. You have to prepare the movement, whether it's a vertical or you're turning like this or you're turning like this and you're doing this. When you're here, the body has to create a position. So when the body doesn't create the position, I call it the manipulation of skeletal structure. If you don't create the position before you execute, you, there's a, a good chance you're in the wrong place. So if you're in the wrong place and you don't set up the right um, preparation sort of for the next movement, then you really will have a little trouble finding that space. So, so spatial awareness, proprioception, all of the stuff that we talk about you know, in 
our movements is really uh, a heightened awareness, knowing and controlling each and every motion because we're manipulating our body to create these. So it's really, um, you know, fairly simple if you just break it down into uh, little components because that's the only way we can actually um, develop it. You know, when we talk about center line, we only have one center line in the front. You have one center line to the side, and then everything else is angular. But when, we, when you reference yourself as one center line, it really depends on where you're facing and where you're heading. You know, we have two eyes in the front of our head. The rest of it really requires that we turn to see. So, I mean, if you're visually impaired, it's uh, really difficult to learn something that's visual. But, you know, when you have heightened sensitivity, you can start to use your audio and your imagination and your visualization based on what you begin to understand. Uh, on, you know, on the movement side of it, you have to sort of imagine what the body's doing to create these actions. And then from that visual assimilation or the, the uh, motion that you capture as an image is really probably two-dimensional. When you take it into movement, then it, you add the dimensions. And that dimensional understanding evolves and changes based on how much or how well you can adapt to your space and know what space is. You know, space is something that we don't uh, pay attention to unless we move. So the thing is, if you're always sitting, um, it's not going to be helpful when you start to twist and turn. Now, leg work, when you go like this and you spin and you go from one leg to the other leg and you lift and you do this and you do this, all of these things become a heightened sensitivity to landing, how soft your feet have to be, how much tension your leg should have. If you're very tense and you're dropping in hand, your knees are locking up, you're gonna cause some havoc on the knees. And, and then your feet, your feet have to be nimble. You know, we got you know, hundreds of bones in our feet, well, there's a lot of them anyways, that have to be part of that whole action. And if you don't, uh, you know, there's a little conflict in it, that's when you get a little bit of a tenderness in that area that's not releasing because it maybe gets stressed or strained and then um, you'll have a problem with your feet. So anyways, uh, we went through the form twice. I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, I think it's about, what time is it now? Yeah, just about time. So, uh, you know, hope you got something out of that. You know, I try to draw an analogies and uh, connections to how you may be thinking about this. And um, sometimes, you know, in the martial arts, we always use some kind of a metaphor or some kind of, uh, uh, you know, similarity to something that you've experienced. So we learn from that as well. You know, when you can make that connection to what that might be that you've done, you know, in, in a previous life, then you might say, well, okay, I kind of know that. So, so this is probably not something that people, you know, typically would be doing, but, you know, who knows, you know, holding something in your hand, the only thing you probably do either that's in your hand other than a writing instrument is probably a tool um, or a, a paintbrush or a paint roller or a, or a pole. And, you know, so a lot of martial arts would develop over the, over the, you know, time through, you know, apparatus or uh, things that we use, farming instruments, you know, things that actually are tangible, and you learn movement, and those movements get translated into what can I do with these movements. So on that note, hopefully uh, you've got something out of this, and I'll see you next time. Um, I'll